Hey, there's something really special about the beginning of the year, and it's fun um, as as a faith community. I I don't know why it is, but it's just this this giant reset button, and really nothing changes. Nothing's really changed from eight days ago, Um, but somehow there's just this rhythm and cycle to our culture, um, in our minds, that when we get to that number one, that first day of the year, we get an opportunity to hit reset. And for a lot of us in our lives, we need to hit that reset button. We need to take time and do that. And we need to evaluate. And we live in a culture that's so, so fast-paced that we don't take a lot of time to to think and evaluate and set goals and do this. So it's a great time of year to do that. And I'm excited this morning to just talk about um, kind of where we're at as a faith community. And and I, like, I'm really excited, so I'm going to try to just get going and get into this stuff because there's nothing really that I I get more passionate um, talking about than talking about our mission and vision and what God's called us into as a faith community. It's it's absolutely exhilarating for me. I love it. Um, I hope you guys love it. And what's even more fun is, is then talking next week about how God's shown up. And so next week is the the state of the church, right? And so God has just been so overwhelmingly good and gracious to us in the last year. I mean, like, it'll blow your mind where where we're at, what we've done. And so uh, I want to invite you to come back next week and hear about the state of the church, um, and we'll look more into the the nitty-gritties and the finances and the details and some of that stuff and leadership and whatnot. Um, But today we're just going to spend some time mission, vision, dreaming, talking, looking back, looking forward, looking where we're at. And it's really fun because when you're in a good, healthy spot, it's really nice to, to be able to, to just keep moving forward and keep going at the pace that God had set out for you. This is the first new year in, I don't know, I'm 39, so probably in 30 years that I didn't have to resolve to start working out on January 1. And that's fun, right? It's fun when you're actually doing what you want to do and you keep doing it. So this is a shameless plug for 517. Men, if your resolution is to get in shape and to have some fellowship and to be a part of an incredible group of men, 517 a.m. in that gym. And there's a dozen men that will, oh, yeah. Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Only Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Okay, we don't want to go over the top, all right? Uh, but this is your official invitation to join us, and it is a lot of fun. It's really, really cool. So, um, but it's, it's fun when things are going as they should. And so this year, I want to talk uh, as we launch into 2018 about our mission and our vision and where we're at. And the cool thing is we're doing what God has called us to do, but we can always press in and do better. And so if you're note takers, I really want to encourage you to take notes. We're going to fly through a ton of scripture, jot these things down, uh, maybe go back and look at, watch, watch this teaching sometime later in the week. If you have anyone that's like fringy, like, ah, I kind of think I should go to church. I don't know. I'm going to turn a new leaf over. I'm going to quit smoking and go to church. Those, those are great <laughs> resolutions, right? Here's a great play, Like, hey, watch this video and you can see what our faith community is about. And hopefully it will inspire them to see what God has done, is doing, is continuing to do in and through us, and where he's calling us to be. So uh, without further ado, here we go. And we're going to, for some of you that uh, are new, you've kind of just been around in the last six months or a year even, this is going to be great for you. Because I'm going to unpack everything down to the way we got our name. So this is going to be really cool. It's going to be really informative. It's all backed up by scripture. So we will have scripture threaded throughout all of this. And, uh, and we got a really cool crescendo ending of, of what we're going to do and an opportunity to pray over someone in a really cool story. All right. So obviously you are sitting at one mosaic church. Okay. And we have this tagline, one purpose, many pieces. And here is the breakdown of how God spoke this thing into existence. Okay, we, we love the word mosaic, which we'll get to in a minute. But there is this important part about this number one. And here's where one came from. In Ephesians 4, uh, verses 4 through 6, it says, There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So as we were dreaming this thing up and trying to listen and discern where the Holy Spirit was taking us, 
we knew that we were called to be this group of whatever God was going to do, this hodgepodge group of people that we wanted things to be different, and we wanted lives to be different and change and not just look the same stereotypical cookie-cutter place. But we also know that we're connected through Christ with everyone. That there is this oneness under Christ. That He is head. And that there is one capital C church. And because Jesus speaks something into us that says, we want you to do something a little different, doesn't mean other people are doing it wrong. And we want to be, we want to be clear on that. There's different churches for different people. And that's okay. Because as long as God's word's being preached and there's truth there and people are growing and moving, then the body of Christ, a body, singular body, advances and moves forward. And we always want to be about the body of Christ here. So I even try, language really matters to me, and I really try to be intentional. And you guys can like pull out a follow card if you hear me on, on stage. But I try to never refer to us as our body. Because that creates a little subtle mindset that we're our own body. We're our entity away from the body. And we're not. We're a small C church. We're an arm, a kneecap, a buttocks, whatever you want to call us, okay? Well, I don't care. But we're part of the greater body that's moving and advancing the kingdom of God across the world. And that's incredible. That's a powerful thing to be part of. So that's why the number one came into our name as well, because we never want to forget the importance of the one, the one true God that we serve, the one baptism, um, and the one church that we are all a part of. So when our brothers down the road hurt, when, when something happens at another church, when we have a shooting in Texas, we ache with them because they are our brothers and sisters. They are the church just like we are the church. And we cannot forget that. We cannot forget the importance of playing together. I believe God just smiles down on his people when he sees people playing together. And that's what we want to do. Okay? So then, we have the word mosaic. And, and for a lot of us, we'll resonate with this part, right? This broken and fragmented part of humanity that we're all in. Okay? And so Romans 3, 23 and 24 says, For all have sinned. Okay, so if any of you have forgotten that, that your little shard of glass isn't broken, fragmented, a little jagged, a little not perfect, okay? God reminds us, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But here's what's cool too, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So important here, because some people in this universalist mindset will say, all are justified through his grace. And they'll just leave that. And they forget about through the redemption of Christ Jesus, through their faith in Christ Jesus. Okay, so, so all have the invitation to be in. All are in. All have fallen short. All are sinners. But we have to respond through Christ Jesus. So, so this is this idea of this mosaic. It's this broken, fragmented, if, if we take a piece of glass and we just drop it up here and it's just all these shards of broken glass, you look at it and go, that is completely worthless. Okay, but then you get someone like Ryan Bills and a little bit of art and strategery and putting these things and putting them all together, right? And all of a sudden, well, I'm calling you God for a minute, right? No, he's not. Under the artful hand of God, though, God takes all of our little broken, fragmented lives and he puts them together. And you stand back and you look at it and you go, oh my gosh, that's incredible. It's beautiful. Right? Because we could come up here one at a time and we could talk about how broken and hurt and just messy our lives are, those deep, deep parts of us. But the truth is when we look down at this and we see this, it's just absolutely beautiful. It's beautiful what God does when he rallies his people together and they come together and the Holy Spirit is kind of like, it's kind of like the thing that glues us all together and fills in the gaps. And it's just this beautiful thing that God does. So, so that's where our name came from. That's where the idea of one mosaic came from. So then we have this tagline, one purpose, many pieces. And we really, really believe in this. And here's the idea behind one purpose. Um, 1 Corinthians, Paul says in chapter 10, verse 31, so whenever you eat or drink or whatever you do, it's this huge broad statement. 
Whether you eat, drink, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. And that, friends, is our purpose. What is your purpose in life? What is my purpose in life? What is our purpose in life? What is the purpose of any kid that's um, being born into this world? What is the purpose of all humanity? It is to bring glory to God. And when we live outside of that purpose, or in contradiction with that purpose, that's when life really starts to fall apart. And so that is our one purpose in our tagline, to bring glory to God and God alone. Fame to his name, not to ours. All right? And then we have many pieces. And so from John 3.16, a verse you guys all know, right? Everybody knows the John 3.16 verse. But here's the idea of the many pieces. For God so loved the world. The world. Guess what? That includes those far from God who have not surrendered to Jesus. They're, They're still part of the mosaic. They're still part of the people that God, want to re- God wants to redeem. And so sometimes we can get this posture a little bit where we look like, well, we've been redeemed. Our, our piece has been put in the puzzle. And, and I, like I'll never forget, there was one time early on in Mosaic where, where we had some people serving and helping that they were super far from God. Their lifestyles were super far from God. And I remember someone coming and approaching me like, doesn't that concern you? Someone in your church is far from God. Like, hey, I, I'm the pastor. I'm fun. Like, let's talk. You, know, you want to talk about my junk? No, it doesn't concern me. I think it's incredible that someone that's far from God, living a lifestyle that's really kind of countered God, is in the place of God where God's people gather and is serving. I can't think of a better place for them to be. And that's where we want. And so we want to be this all-inclusive, like, come on in. We want you. We want you to serve. We want. Now, obviously, we need to be careful for all of us of where we serve and what we do. And we need to make sure the strengths line up and all that stuff. But, but we want people. We don't want to be this, hey, like, we're, you're in, you're out. We're this country club. You've got to meet X, Y, and Z or you can't come in. Okay, so that's that idea of many pieces. And then it continues, and you know the rest of that scripture, but he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And that, that's what we need to profess here. That's the gospel message. So God loved the whole world, not just his chosen people. God didn't just love those that sit in a church on Sunday morning. God loves the people that are coming off a high, broken right now. He loves the people that are so hurted, hurting and far from God right now. He loves them. He's broken for them. And the truth is, those of us who have done this second part, who have put our faith and trust in Him, our hearts should break for that same thing. And our heart and prayer should be for those that don't have the hope that we have, don't have the purpose that we have. So, so we all, there's many pieces, and we can't forget that. Okay? Because I feel like sometimes we, we kind of go, oh, all the pieces are together. It's really good. We're perfect right here. Let's keep this nice, safe, little holy huddle. And we got one purpose, but now we have like our pieces together. The puzzle's done. No, 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 no. There's so many pieces that God wants to continue to put in and out of our mix, and we can't forget that, okay? Um, here's one of my favorite things when, when we're talking about mosaic. This just rattles people. Hey, what's your vision? Zero. Okay, well, that's a stellar vision, right? Um, and I, I still, I remember sitting in, in my office with our, our early launch team, and we're like, man, what's our vision? Because a vision is something that you shouldn't be attainable, you know, like, because if you attain it, now you've got to set another vision. And, and we just landed on this word zero. Well, what's zero? Well, we want zero people left in Lenawee County that, that don't know Jesus. We want zero children going to bed hungry tonight. We want zero people oppressed. We want zero people depressed. We want zero divorce rate. Right? This is what we're called to do. And here's the scripture where this is really birthed out of. And it's Jesus' prayer in Matthew 6. And Jesus is teaching them how to pray. And he says this, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, there is zero suffering. There is zero starving children. There is zero abuse. There is zero divorce. And so if we really want God's kingdom to come here, 
then we have a call as his church, as his bride, as his children, to work to try to make that happen. And so is that vision unattainable? Yeah, probably so. But that's what we're called to have, is an unattainable vision that keeps motivating us and compelling us and pushing us to go further, to go to the next thing, to keep diving in. Okay, so that's our vision. And so now when someone says, hey, what's the vision of your church? You can just say, hey, grab a cup of coffee. Let's talk for a minute, okay? This is going to be a fun conversation. Um, and it's, it's great because that's the beauty. That's the essence of, of Jesus' heart. It's why he came to redeem the whole world, that zero would be lost and broken and far from him. Okay, most of you know this, which is good. Um, it's frustrating when there's an organization and you, like, interview their staff, and you're like, hey, what's the mission of the organization? And, like, you interview six people and you get six different answers. The beautiful thing is most of you here have heard these words, love, live, lead, in that sequence enough that you understand that that's, that's our mission. Now, a mission is like a marching order that we feel like this is what God's called us into. And we don't want to steer from this. We, everything that we do and what we think through, it, it's constantly trying to, to run it through the lens of love, live, lead, like Jesus and for Jesus. Because this is what God's called us to do. Now, let me just take a minute and break some of these down for you because it's important that we understand this. Otherwise, they just become three kind of trendy words on your wristband. But there's a lot of depth behind these words. Here's the first one. We love this, we love this scripture, Matthew 22, okay? And here's what Jesus, he's, he's questioned, he's asked, what's the greatest commandment of the law? And Jesus replies, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. This is the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he doesn't even stop there. And then he says this really interesting thing. He says, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. And that's powerful because that's saying everything that's happened thus far, all the Old Testament prophets, all the writings, everything that they experienced, they hang on these two commands. Love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So they're in order because we know the Bible is about order and it's about accuracy. So our first call is to love God. That's the first love call we have. Love the Lord with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. The second is to love your neighbor as yourself. So here's the problem. A lot of us take that and we say, love your neighbor, then love yourself. But listen to it. Love your neighbor as yourself. What really comes first in that sentence? Self. Now, this is really tricky, guys, because we live in such a culture that elevates self. Love of self, love of self, love of self. So it's, it's scary. And honestly, like, I, so I love Francis Chan, but I watched a video from Francis Chan a few weeks ago, and he was talking about how, like, the church should never talk about, you know, love yourself. This, this verse is not about love yourself. No, it is about love yourself. But I agree what he's trying to get at is we've got to be so careful when we're in church and we say, love yourself, we all think like, I'm going to go out and buy myself a new Maserati because i got to love myself. I deserve that hot tub, right? I deserve that raise. I deserve whatever. It's not that self-love. It's not self-glorifying. It's not self-comforting love. Okay? It's the love that Jesus demonstrates. So we have to figure out how to love ourselves. And that's a humbly submitted posture. That's a love of ourself because we are loved. Because we're loved by Almighty God. And so here's the problem. And those of you that have been around for years, you've heard me say this. Sometimes I'll talk with people and they're like, man, I'm trying to love my neighbor so much. I'm trying to do it biblically. And it says, love your neighbor as yourself. And I'm trying to love them like I love myself. And I'm like, that's your problem. Really? It's the thing behind the thing. You don't love yourself the way God wants you to love yourself. You don't have all your value and all your worth and all of who you are coming from God. Because that's where we got to get first. We have to have proper, healthy, biblical love of ourselves and understanding who we are in Christ so that then we can go out and love our neighbor as ourself in a healthy way, in a holy way, in a humbly submitted way. Following me? It's, it's good. It's deep. We have to get that right. 
Because if we just go out and we try to do this like worldly love with people, then we're just loving them like the other rest of the world. We've got to love them with this Jesus love. And to do that, we have to first love ourselves that way. We have to see our own value. We have to see our own worth. We have to not doubt who we are. We have to understand that we're fully bought with a price, that we're resurrected, that we've overcome death, that we've overcome sin because Christ is in us. Now we can go love the world. Okay, so that's the first part of love. And then the second verse that goes along with it is 1 John 4.19, and it just explains it perfectly. Simple. We love because he first loved us. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's the only way we love biblically. It's the only way we love correctly. If we try to love someone out of our own, mm, I'm going to love them, man. I'm going to really, really love them. No, you're, you're going to run out of love, okay? Because our love is very limited. When we love because God first loved us, now it's, it's this unconditional, it's, it's unending because we see the greater meaning behind it. And so that's how we got to love. Now, we jump to live. Okay, and live is an important thing. So here's the thing. We have this crazy love encounter with God. Transforms us. It, it just starts like all of our purpose, all of our meaning, all of who we are starts to be birthed out of God's love for us. And we're like, wow, this is incredible. So then all of a sudden we start to realize things like this, like 1 Corinthians 3 where it says, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? And you're like, holy crap. Can you say that when you're talking about God? I guess so, right? God's spirit dwells in me. The hope of glory, the mystery is that God's Holy Spirit comes in us. He dwells in us. That's unbelievable. The whole Old Testament was this thing where God's, God's spirit moved and you had to follow it. And it was this holy place. And then all of a sudden Jesus comes and he dies and he's resurrected. And now his spirit comes in us. And God lives in us. So we have this love moment. And then all of a sudden we start living differently because we're like, whoa, God's in us. I feel different. I'm acting different. I, like things look different to me. I have different perspectives. So we start living different. We start doing this. We start uh, 2 Timothy 2 verses, verse 21 says, Therefore, if anyone cleanses themselves from what is dishonorable, we start seeing like, wow, I'm taking dishonorable things out of my life. I'm living differently. They will be a vessel for honorable use. Set apart as holy. Set apart, friends, not set above. Let us remember that, brothers and sisters. We're set apart. We're not set above. Because we have Christ doesn't mean we're elevated above anyone else that doesn't. It means we have been set apart to be holy, to be a conduit for his, his blessing, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So we have good work that God's calling us to do. And that's why he's empowered us to live differently. So, so we have this love encounter, right? And then all of a sudden we're like, wow, life is really, really different. So let me, let me show you what starts to happen. And some of you have seen this, and it's, really, it's like you're like going along life. Oh, that's really fun. Life's really good, right? And then all of a sudden, you know what? I'm going to move this. So I'm going to draw big for you. Whoa, 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 hang on. So we're going along life, and life's really good. And then all of a sudden, we come into this moment where God meets us and we understand his love. We understand his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness. It's this unbelievable thing. And then all of a sudden it starts to send us in this upward direction going, wow, this is incredible. I'm so in love with God and I'm changing in my life. I'm, I'm getting rid of dishonorable things in my life and I want God to use me and do all this stuff. And so we get to this point here where we start really living differently. And we're like getting rid of some things we never, like, man, I, what's, what's humbling is having one of my best friends from childhood in here, okay? Like, my mouth as a high schooler was horrendous, horrendous, horrible, okay? I mean, bad, right? But all of a sudden, there's this Jesus encounter, and, and it starts changing, and, and not because I'm, like, trying to change. It's just, like, I don't need to do that. I can be more creative than using that word to come up with something else, right? And all of a sudden, oh, that's not really holy. That doesn't feel good. And so all of a sudden, things start changing in us. Now, here's the danger. 
in what a lot of our society and even a lot of religious institutions, churches want to do is they go, okay, you had this love encounter. Good, good, good. You're starting to live differently. Now let's just keep you right here. Let's keep you right here. Let's keep learning how to live differently. Bible 101, Bible 102, Bible 103, Bible 104. Holy cow, you're like Mother Teresa. You're like a saint. We're sending you on mission trips. Like, don't, don't do anything crazy. Just live right here. Just live safe. And we just, and we're like, our life's different. But this is, the, this is the Christian that's like followed Jesus for 30 years and you go, what's the most exhilarating thing that you've ever done? Memorized Jesus wept, right? Like memorize some scripture or something like you've been following Almighty God for 30 years. That's the most exhilarating thing you've ever done. Because if a church or whatever, if, if they can get you in and just say, just stay in this program. Just stay right here. Just learn more, learn more, learn more. This is content. Learn more, learn more, learn more and you never get sent back out, then it gets really mundane. And guys, I'm all about learning. I, I learn something new from this book every week, almost every day. It's incredible. It's humbling. The more I study this book is the more I realize how little I know. Okay? So, so the, the thing is not to just live in this endless circle, and the way you bust out of the circle is you get to a point in your life where you decide that you're going to lead for Christ. You're going to stand up. You're going to say something to that person at the water cooler. You're going to tell them why your life's different. You're going to tell them why your marriage is different. You're going to tell them why you have the hope that you do. You're going to tell them why you dropped that $50 bill on that, that person's hand that, that needed food. You're going to lead for Jesus. Okay, and that's when this thing gets radically different. And the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to entrust them to reliable people. It's this idea of reproducing reproducers. And that's how God's kingdom grows. That you would take the things you hear and you gather and you learn and then you'd go out and you would tell them. And you would entrust them to other people. And guys, here's what happens when you get to that moment right there that you start leading for Jesus, it shoots you out on this path again. And it makes you fall more in love with him. And you fall more in love with Jesus again. And then guess what? You start living even more different than you thought you ever could. Last year I gave 3%. Well, this year I gave 10 Why'd that happen? He started leading for Christ. And he spurred something in you and he pushed you into this deeper love with him that pushed you into a deeper way of living. And now you come back around here and you lead again and it pushes you out again. And then you get this crazy, fun, exhilarating ride that is known as being a Christ follower. That's what our life should look like. Not this linear, boring line not this static, circular thing that you're on the merry-go-round, you can't get off. Merry-go-rounds are horrible. You put me on the corkscrew, and I'm like, wah, that's awesome, right? And that, that's, that's the point of following Jesus. It's supposed to be exhilarating. It's supposed to be something full of life. It's supposed to be something that you can't do on your own. Guys, you can sit here and spin your wheels on your own your entire life. And you'll get to the end of your life and you'll look back and you'll go, man, I miss this and I miss that and I wish I would have said that and I wish I would have gave that person a hug and I wish I would have gave that and that's a terrible way to end your life with regret. Or you can lead for Christ and he will push you into something that's absolutely life-changing. A very common scripture and this is the last thing we'll talk about with lead but when Jesus some of his last words that he's leaving to us on this earth as he, after he comes back and he's talking with the disciples and he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Go. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always. It's interesting. This is like the promise from Scripture when God says, Surely I am always with you. When? When you go. When you go and make disciples. Is he always with you? Yeah, he's always with you. 
But I'm telling you, man, he's like right there with you. He's like grabbing you going, you can do it. Keep going. Have that conversation. Do it. I'm right here with you. I will step into that gap, that, that place where you're scared and you think it can't happen. I will step into that and I will make a way for you to do what you have to do. I am with you surely to the end of the days when you go and you make disciples, when you reproduce reproducers, when you lead for Christ. And so sometimes in our life we feel like God never shows up. And I would say, well, he doesn't necessarily have to show up when there's no place for him to show up and intervene. Maybe we need to create some space where we need God. Maybe we need to do something big enough, god size, where he has to show up and he has to do something. All right. Told you I like this stuff. Gosh. You kidding me? It's 1059 already. I have 15 more slides. No, I don't. I'm just kidding. Actually, we're close. Um, so that's our, that's our tagline, our mission, our vision, okay? That's, that's, what, that's what just gets me amped up because here's the thing. It's all out of Scripture. And here's the other thing. I've watched people go through this. And I've watched this happen, and it's awesome. I had a conversation, a lunch with a gentleman this week who's a sophomore in college who's been like really following Jesus for about six months. And so guess what? Six months ago, he had this moment. And all of a sudden, his life started to change. And then guess what he does? Six months following Jesus. Starts a Bible study on his campus. A secular, big campus. I'm going to start a Bible study. Do you know what he says to me? I don't feel qualified to lead a Bible study. I don't know. I've been following this Jesus guy for six months. No, you're absolutely qualified. That is absolutely awesome. And you know what? Your life is going to transform and go so much further than getting stuck in this rut and not ever doing anything because you're leading. You're inviting people into the study. You're telling them about it. You're leading for Jesus. It's going to make you fall more in love with him. It's going to continue to transform your life, and you're going to have more opportunities to lead again and again and again. And friends, if I look back at my life, this is the story of my life. Love encounter with God starts changing my life, have an opportunity to lead for him. And thank God I took it. Thank God I stepped into it. Stepped before a hundred high school kids and started talking about Jesus and singing songs on a guitar. And those of you who have heard me sing, you're like, wow, that's a big step, right? But I had an opportunity to lead for Jesus. I'm like, I'm going to do it. And so we led, and this thing grew and grew and grew, and I felt like, I, who am I to tell these people about Jesus? I don't know anything about Jesus. But I would go back to his word, and I'd be like, God, please tell me something. And I'm like, wow, this is incredible. And all I did was kept telling people what I'm learning. And honestly, that's really what, what we do here. Just tell you what I'm learning. Invite you into the journey. You, you throughout the week, you tell me what you're learning. Sometimes that's what I preach on. Works really good, okay? So let me show you just a couple more slides and then we'll be done. This is a pillars thing that we came up with about four years ago. We haven't had this from the beginning, um, but this is, this is something that's really cool. And when we do our um, On Mission Covenants, which we'll actually do next week when we talk about the state of the church, um, this will be attached to it and you'll see it on a little deeper level. But how do we get to one purpose many pieces to glorify God how do we get there right if we're a temple and this is the temple here's how we kind of move through this journey to actually flesh out our mission and our vision okay these four main pillars are truth service generosity and community and we feel like those are the four pillars that we're called into as a faith community so it's important to know at the bottom we see this word surrender and if you guys were around the last few years, you've heard some of this, but surrender is where it all begins. Either begins or it ends, right there at the base. So surrender is you coming to the end of your life and letting Christ take over. And when you do that, and when you fully surrender, then through prayer, you can dive into truth, truth, scripture, knowledge, application, right? You can start to serve action, in-reach, outreach, that we take care of the world out there, but we'd also take care of our brothers and sisters in here. It's okay to serve one another. It's okay to take meals to one another. Okay, but we also have to go out. It's got to be this balance. It's both and. 
Generosity. We always talk about here at Mosaic, your time, your talent, your treasure. Because there's some of us that have incredible treasure, monetary value, that we can give and give and give, and it's beautiful. And there's other of us that have time. And sometimes the people with the, the treasure don't have the time. And we need time, and we need treasure. And we need talent. We need people that can hook up cables and make things work and do different audio options. And th there's all kinds of talent that we need. So we need all of these things. We're called to steward all of them and be generous in that. That we understand that it's a sacrifice and that we're blessed only to bless. Okay, we are blessed, friends, because we are called to be a blessing. Community, uh, natural, missional, and identifiable, those take so long to unpack, I'm not even going to get into them. But we, we need to have community here. It needs to be healthy. It needs to be natural. It needs to be missional, meaning all our community should be moving somewhere, should have a point behind it. And it should be identifiable. Like when you see a group of mosaic people together, you should be like, wow, they're different. They look different. I, I want you to look different. I don't want you to blend into the world. I want you to look different, so identifiable. And then we have this obedience and intimacy is kind of the top of those pillars. And, and that's either the lid, friends, or that opens up life. And whether you choose to really live obedient and intimate with God or whether you shut that down, that will say how far you're going to go in your faith journey. That's either going to be the lid that goes, okay, you're done being obedient. You're not going to be any more intimate with God. That's your lid. Spiritually, you're not going to go any further. When you crack that lid open and go, okay, I'll be more intimate. I'll be more vulnerable. I'll be more obedient. Your life continues to grow and your transformation continues to happen and God gets glory. Okay? So, uh, here's what we're going to end with. This is cool. Um, I had a conversation with Andrew Brown about uh, three months ago. And he said, Dan, you know what I've always appreciated about Mosaic for as long as I remember is you guys, you always, there's always like a theme for the year. And uh, he said, have you ever like wrote down all the themes for the, whole, for the whole existence of Mosaic? And I was like, well, I have them. I could probably go back in my journals and find them all. So in this past week, I spent time going back through my journals, back from 2010, um, listening to some podcasts of different teachings, looking at series we did. And so here are the themes that we have gone through in the last seven years. In 2010, our launch was You Are the Church. It was trying to reprogram people's mind to understand church is not an hour on a Sunday. It's not a place you come in and check in and check out. You are the church 24-7, 365. And that was our mantra, and that's what we beat, and that was our theme year one. Then we did the Love, Live, Lead, and we, we really unpacked that and moved through that in year two. We read a book uh, by David Platt called Radical. Some of you remember that. Some of you left during that time, and then you came back after it was done. You want, you want a great book to read, read Radical. It will radically change your life. But our goal and our mission was to live radically. And what's really actually crazy and sad, we talked about this as a leadership team, as we said, it's really sad that you write a book on how you live scripturally, and in our world you have to call it radical. Because it shouldn't be called radical, it should be called normal. That's how we're called to live, but it seems so radical to us as Christ followers. So we did this radical, and then there was another book called Radical Together that he did, and we did that. It was more about community, living life on purpose. We really focused in on being purposeful in our lives day in and day out. In 14, we had a big teaching series called Casual to Committed. That was our big theme for that year of people being committed, of really like the newness of Mosaic was wearing out, right? The honeymoon stage was over. So are you in or are you out? Are you going to be committed? Are we going to be casual committed Christians or committed Christians? Um, listen was 2015. Some of you guys were around for that. Be still and know. And then that followed up right into 2016 was obey. And that's some of you that's been around the last few years, you've heard that a lot. Listen and obey. Listen and obey. It's kind of just become part of our ethos is listen and obey. That was a really big thing that God was teaching us. Last year in 2017, we kicked off with Claire DeGraff and we did our our book study and the whole idea I taught on that story of Mary and Martha and it was the idea of sit before you serve and guys it's been incredible throughout this year in a serving capacity having people say 
yeah, let me, let me pray about that. Let me really think through that. Let me make sure my heart is ready to serve, that I'm serving out of overflow, not out of obligation. So that was really cool. So sit before you serve. So in 2018, um, as I prayed through this and really thought about this, here's what I feel like God is leading us into. And this was a message I actually did probably three or four months ago. And remember, we did the puzzle pieces. And it's, we wrote, do your part on the puzzle piece. I still have mine sitting on my desk. I probably had a dozen of you email pictures of yours sitting on your desk, on your dashboard, wherever. Do your part. And I believe in 2018, this is what God is calling us into as a faith family. Do your part. In your marriage, do your part. With your kids, do your part. In your workplace, do your part. In your community, do your part. In your faith family, do your part. And it's twofold. A, it's a call to get off our butts and do your part. Because some of us aren't doing our part. But here's the other part. B is some of us are doing other people's parts. We're trying to do things that we're not created to do, that we're not called to do. We're trying to be people that we aren't. So what is your part in all those areas? And then do it. We have to figure that out and we have to do it. So, so our theme this year that I feel like God's really leading us into is that theme of do your part. 